Welcome to the 11th century Roman Empire, a superstate stretching from Italy to Armenia. Welcome to Constantinople, the queen of cities. The Romans no longer feared the threat of constant barbarian raids after a heroic generation's efforts. How long will this harmony last? For this episode of Eastern Rome summarized at least, now let's discover how things fell apart under the withering Macedonian dynasty. First, let's quickly talk about how people generally characterize this era. Decline and corruption due to the conflict between the civil and military aristocracy of the empire. Like many of these decline narratives, this was only partially true. Indeed, the age of conquest was over, and emperors after Vasileus favored the high society of Constantinople more than the dynasty. but conquests were still made in this period and Rome was indisputably superior to its neighbors. There was also a great cultural flourishing in the empire, especially in the capital, and we get to know some of the most distinguished intellectuals in East Roman history, namely two great sources for 11th century history called Michael, Psellos the polymath on the civil aristocracy side and Atleates the judge on the military aristocracy side. The 11th century is one of the most lively and well-documented phases of Roman history thanks to all these writers, so I decided to break down the events up to the loss of Anatolia into two videos so more could be covered. Now, Constantinos VIII became sole emperor and ruled for three mediocre years. Unlike his brother, he had kids, three daughters, Evdokia the pious one, Zoe the hot one, and Theodora the smart one. Their father and uncle adored them, but never got to arrange marriages for them, and now they were old. Evdokia became a nun, so the duty of carrying on the Macedonian line fell upon Zoe and Theodora, and Constantinos was the last male Macedonian ruler. So what did he do? First, he cancelled the already prepared expedition to Sicily, abandoning his late brother's final wish. But he did share Vigilio's distrust with dignity and love for blinding, so he blinded a lot of the new generation of these aristocratic families like Burtis, Comnenos, Scleros, Focas, Corquas, and so on, even though the new gen did nothing wrong. In their place, Constantinos elevated eunuchs and less prominent men, who were quite successful. An Arab fleet was crushed by Samos and Hyo Stratigi in 1026. In 1027, Constantinos Diogenes, Bulgaria's dukes, repelled raiding Pechenics, since now Bulgaria, as a part of Rome, no longer buffered it from nomads. Diogenes was also the father of a very important character in our next video. At the same time, George died, and his widow, Mariam, started a brief war with the empire for her son Bagrat IV, but Nikolaus, a eunuch domesticus, raided Georgia until she sued for peace in 1028. The Vasilis fell ill later that year, and he needed to find matches for his daughters, pronto, or the dynasty would end. He first chose the dukes of Antioch, Constantinos de Lassinus, but settled on the apocryphed city, Romanos Argyros, to marry Zoe. After coercing Romanos' wife to a nunnery, Constantinos died. He wasn't a terrible ruler, but he pales in comparison to his brother and was the first of a long line of mediocre rulers in this century. As both Romanos and Zoe were very old, they tried all sorts of ways to create a Macedonian heir, but all attempts were futile, so after a while they gave up on their marriage. Romanos wasn't good at Park, but a mediocre emperor. He and Zoe taunted Theodora, the only other legitimate Macedonian, to secure his claim. He reversed all of Vasileo's policies to limit the dynasty's power and squandered the full treasury Vasileo left behind to seem generous like most of his successors would. His knowledge in various fields was superficial at best, but he pretended to be a philosopher like Marcus Aurelius one day and a great conqueror like the Bulgar Slayer on the next. Psilos was not impressed, nor was anybody else. Romanos had military ambitions, despite being completely incompetent on the field, and he wanted to conquer Aleppo, a harmless emirate with an overwhelming non-Roman population, now led by Myrdasids. The Dukes of Antioch attacked Aleppo but was repulsed in 1029. In 1030, Romanos went there personally and showed his complete lack of common sense. He rejected Aleppo's peace offer, camped his army in Azaz, a bad location, and the Aleppo surprise attacked the camp, routing the Romans. The defeat wasn't devastating, but it was humiliating. Romanos fled Syria in shame, but left some competent officers there, two eunuchs and the most talented general of the era, Georgius Maniakis, who saved his city from the Arabs with trickery. The eunuchs avenged Romanos' loss by raiding Azaz, and Maniakis took Edessa in 1031. The emir of Aleppo submitted to the empire, and after the eunuchs' campaign in Phoenicia, other emirs did so as well in 1032, while Maniakis pacified Edessa and sent a precious relic, a letter written by Jesus Christ, to Constantinople. Those were some great gains in the east, thanks to three generals who cleaned up Romanos' mess and turned his failure to victory. The emperor learned his limits and focused on things he was better at. He initiated building projects and negotiated better rights for Christians living in the Fatimid Caliphate. In 1033, he even sent a naval raid on Alexandria to demonstrate Roman force to the Fatimids, while the empire made more gains in the Caucasus. However, he would soon meet his end. 
a Paphlagonian eunuch called Ioannis Orphanotrophos gained much influence at court and plotted for more power by bringing his handsome brother Michael into the palace, who Zoe fell in love with. They started having an affair despite their age difference, and soon, in 1034, Romanos Argyros was murdered in his bath, very possibly at the instigation of Zoe and the Paphlagonians so that Michael can marry her. Michael IV, the Paphlagonian, worked hard for the empire, despite his worsening epilepsy. He was hastily married to Zoe after Ioannis bribed the patriarch to do so, but lost interest in his old lover once he was emperor to the disappointment of Zoe. The Lassinus was mad that this upstart became emperor, so he was placed under house arrest, then discontent in Antioch was also put down. In 1035, Michael named his successor, his nephew Michael, because Ioannis wanted the Paphlagonian dynasty and put members of his family in as many high posts as possible. The Michaels get confusing, I know. The Vasilevs looked for a military glory of his own. Michael revived the Sicilian expedition, even though Italy lost its greatest catapano Ioannis. In 1036, Maniaki set out to reconquer the island with the Varangian Guard, which included the legendary future king of Norway, Harald Hardrada, while Edessa, deprived of his protection, was assailed by Arabs and was saved by the Dukes of Antioch in 1037. Maniakis and Admiral Stephanos, brother-in-law of the emperor, arrived in 1038, and at Rometa, he crushed the Arabs. Then for the next two years, he gained control of Messina, Palermo, and Syracuse. In 1040, when the Arabs finally got a big army, Maniakis annihilated them at the Troina. However, many Arabs escaped, and he blamed Stephanos, who was harshly punished publicly. Then he alienated his Norman mercenaries, who soon got ideas for Italy of their own. When Michael heard this, he arrested Maniakis, so Stephanus was left in charge and all of Maniakis' gains were reversed soon. Sicily was lost forever, but Messina stayed Roman for two more years under Catacalon Kick of Menos. In the Balkans, a Bulgarian officer called Peter Delian claimed he was Tsar Samuel's grandson and stirred the Bulgarians against the empire. Michael led his army in person to quell the rebellion, even though his epilepsy was almost killing him. Delian defeated Michael at Thessaloniki, then captured a lot of Roman cities, but soon Delian blundered. He sent his cousin, Alusian, to fight the Romans, but he got crushed at Thessaloniki. Alusian and Delian now suspected each other, and Alusian blinded his cousin. In 1041, Michael fought again in person, this time with Hardrada, and won a crushing victory over Delian at the Battle of Ostrovo, then retook the cities the Bulgarians took. Hardrada got the nickname Bulgar Burner for his impressive feats. Later that year, Michael returned to Constantinople for his triumph and executed Delian, but his victory in Bulgaria took a massive toll on his health and he soon died. The young Paphlagonian managed his empire well enough for the short time he had, and now Michael V, nicknamed Calafaris for the profession of his father Stephanos, took the purple. Michael V freed prisoners like Delasinos and Maniakis, who he made Catapano of Italy, but turned on his uncle and benefactor, the Orphanotrophos, by exiling him and the other Paphlagonians. He castrated many male members of his family to make sure he was his own man, and he wasn't done just yet, as his next target was his adoptive mother, Zoe. In 1042, he arrested and exiled her, but that spelled his doom. The people of Constantinople loved the Macedonians, as you might recall, and how could they allow this young upstart to do dirty to the last legitimate faces of this dynasty? The crowd turned on Michael and rioted, and then fetched both Zoe and Theodora from their monastic exile to be crowned as joint empresses, despite Theodora's unwillingness. The people and Varangians declared for their Macedonian sovereigns while Michael fled to a monastery, but the crowd dragged him out and Hardrada personally blinded him. The people thought now all was good, but they hadn't realized that Zoe and Theodora hated each other, and the sisters decided that a male emperor was needed. Zoe was over 60, but she still hunted for a new husband. She first chose Dalasinos, but he wasn't to her taste, so Zoe looked to the gentle and amiable Constantinos Monomachos, who was then proclaimed emperor. Monomachos' reign was pivotal in the history of the empire, as many of the enemies and problems that plagued it through its later history first appeared then, like the Normans who came to southern Italy. Some were there since the Second Battle of Cana, but now more slowly infiltrated Italy and took advantage of chaos to steal it for themselves. The Catapani of Italy at all proven ineffective against the Normans recently, including Voyawani's son, Ex Augustus, but in 1042, Catapano Maniakis arrived to salvage the situation, and was successful at first. However, Monomachos ignored and tried to replace Maniakis, while the brother of his mistress, Maria Sclarina Cagelos, and also disgraced the Catapano, who had a huge temper. Maniakis had enough of being caught up in court intrigue, so in 1043, he revolted against Monomachos after being proclaimed emperor by his troops. The rebels arrived in the Balkans and was victorious all the way until a random loyalist arrow killed Maniakis. So by pure luck, the Vasilev survived a serious threat to his rule, and the usurper's head was displayed in the Hippodrome.
While the civil war was raging, the Serbs of Duklia broke from Roman control, Monomachus put down minor revolts, and his fleet incinerated a hostile Rus fleet with great fire. Then Kikavmenos struck down the fleeing Rus. One more challenge remained to Monomachus' rule, the people. As I mentioned, he had a mistress, and in 1044, the masses felt as if this Sclerina had too much influence and might harm Zoe and Theodora to gain more power, so they rioted and almost hurt the emperor until the sisters reassured the people that everything was fine. We might get an impression that Monomachus was a weak ruler from these events, but that's not quite true. Though as a staunch supporter of the civil administration who appointed many officials to run civil matters in the provinces at the expense of the thematic system, making the strategy of the themata gradually lose their civil authority to these bureaucrats, he by no means neglected the military. In 1045, the Romans annexed the Armenian kingdom of Ani, but unfortunately exposed them to new enemies, the Seljuk Turks, who were migrating west since Vasileu's time. In 1046, they arrived in the Roman Caucasus spreading trouble, so Manomachus and the Georgian general departed against them. But the Turks won the battle and captured the Dukes of Vasporakin. Back in the capital, Manomachus founded new schools in the University of Constantinople and created the title Castle of Philosophers for a polymath historian Psellos, who had distinguished himself in court. Life in Constantinople was great, but not in the border regions, as hordes of Pechenex showed up to the Danube seeking refuge in the empire. Hmm, kinda like the Goths in the 4th century, no? Monomachus settled them in the Balkans. In 1047, rival Pechenex crossed the frozen Danube into Roman territory, but the settled Pechenex took care of those rivals for the emperor and all the Pechenex became settlers in the empire. Yet that year, Monomachus had to deal with another revolt, from his relative, Leon Tornikios, an officer of Adrianople. The Thracian soldiers had been bothered by the Pechenic ordeal somehow and hailed Tornikios as emperor. They besieged Constantinople, but the citizens rushed to the defense of their emperor, who appeared courageously on the walls, and soon Tornikios' army lost their nerve and retreated. The army of the east came over, caught Tornikios in Thrace, and dragged him before the emperor to be blinded. In 1048, the Romans fought the Turks again, and this time they had better luck. Kick of Menos, not the Dukes of Ani ambushed the hell out of the Turks at Capitu with his Georgian allies at night, and they pursued the nomads until dawn, but the pirates stupidly got captured by the Turks and Monomachus had to pay a lot to get him back. Now having fully realized the threat of the Turks, the emperor decided to send some of his Pechenegs to defend the east in 1049, but they decided to turn back and treacherously revolted. The Balkans were terrorized, Monomachus even had to pull men from the east to deal with the Pechenegs threat. The Romans lost a lot to the Pechenegs at first, suffering a heavy defeat in 1050, but then they changed strategy to guerrilla tactics and their luck began to turn. Back in the capital, Zoe died and now the Macedonian dynasty was truly in its last days. The emperor sent his barbarian mercenaries to harass the Pechenegs with guerrilla warfare for three years until he could muster another large army in 1053, which sadly also got annihilated. But surprisingly, the Pechenegs themselves had enough of fighting and sued for peace, so the conflict was resolved. Monomachus needed money badly, for he had to deal with more threats than his predecessors, so he accelerated the debasement of the currency that had started under them. Fans of Roman history will remember that the Romans suffered a huge economic crisis back in the 3rd century because emperors had been debasing the value of coins, and the economy was only saved by Constantine the Great, who issued a stable gold currency, the Solidus, which had maintained its 24k gold content until now and provided Rome a good economy even in its darkest days. But now, as the Solidus declined, so did the Roman economy. Worse, the Normans menaced Italy even more, and in 1053, even the papacy had enough of those terrorists, allying with the Romans against them. Pope Leo IX worked with the Catapano of Italy and led an army against the Normans at Civitate, but he was defeated and the plan to save Italy failed. Now a Norman hostage, Leo acknowledged their presence in Italy in 1054. And that's not even the worst thing to happen that year, but at least there's some good news. The Romans successfully defended Manzikar city against the Turks, though they wouldn't be so lucky 27 years later. Now back to the bad news. The Patriarch of Constantinople was Michael Kerularius, who had a strong personality and criticized the practices of the Latin Church with Leon, his Archbishop of Ard. Pope Leo, who had an equally strong personality and believed in papal supremacy, criticized the Romans back. This hostile exchange went on until some papal legates stepped into the Hagia Sophia and excommunicated Carolarius, who in turn soon excommunicated the legates himself. We now call this excommunication the Great Schism because the rift between the churches of Rome and Constantinople never healed and divided Christendom into two parts, Catholic and Orthodox. For the sake of Italy, Monomachus wanted a good relationship with the papacy, but his efforts to stop the schism were in vain and in 1055, he died. Theodora, 
the last surviving member of the Macedonian line, was dying too. The empire's apogee was truly at an end. The people, ever loyal to their favorite dynasty, quickly reacclaimed Theodora as sole empress, and like Irene of Athens, she ruled alone, though not for long. Unlike her predecessors, she didn't hand out lavish gifts due to the ever-tightening financial situation. She ruled decently, but still had opposition. Kirolatis complained about Theodora openly, and the office of Nikiforos Vrienius tried to usurp, but he quickly got arrested. Meanwhile, the Seljuks took Baghdad, becoming a major power in the Near East, and the Fatimids captured Laodikea, but the Romans retook it in 1056. However, this brief period of relative peace was soon end, as Ola Theodora named a random successor called Michael before dying in August, thus ending the glorious Macedonian dynasty that ruled Rome for two centuries. Michael VI Stratioticus was now emperor, but he was too weak to rule for long. He freed, but alienated Vrienius, so the ambitious officer plotted against him. There were also many important military men discontent with the regime and ready to establish a new legitimate dynasty. Take of Menos, Constantinos Ducas, and Isaacios Komnenos, to just name a few. They decided it was time for a more militaristic rule under a military emperor like Vasileus, and they chose Isaacius as their leader. The Dinati rebelled in 1057, and after a brief civil war, Michael decided to negotiate with them. Psyllos led this negotiation, but it failed. While in the city, Kerolarius stirred the people to cheer for Isaacius and advised Michael to abdicate, which the emperor agreed to. Michael became a monk, and Isaacius became the emperor. So that was the start of the troubles that the Romans had to face in their last few centuries of struggling for the right to exist. I myself always wondered how such a strong legacy left with the Bulgar Slayer turned to massacre in less than 50 years. So I dug deeper into this eventful period, trying to see whose fault it was. To my surprise, everyone shared some blame, but the main culprit wasn't a Roman or a barbarian, it was just the tide of history, much like for the Arab conquests. The emperors of the 11th century were indeed softer and more spoiled, but were well-meaning. Zoe's husbands all had their fails, Romanos III in Syria, Michael IV in Sicily, and Constantinus IX in Italy. But none of these were disastrous and they all managed to succeed in other domains. Yet, events elsewhere in the world brought three dangerous new enemies to the borders of Rome at roughly the same time, and Rome was naturally unable to respond perfectly, especially now that the Macedonian dynasty ended and political instability became a problem again. So that's it for this episode. Join me for the heartbreaking narrative about the loss of Anatolia next time. Thank you for watching.